So Dr. Pamela Orr is a physician, teacher, and researcher at the University of Manitoba. Along with Dr. Linda Larcombe and others, she works in partnership with Northern and Indigenous communities nationally and internationally to support and promote health and well-being. Dr. Orr is currently Vice President of the Circumpolar Health Research Network and editor of the International Journal of uh, Circumpolar Health and the research affiliate of the doc, uh, Faculty of Law. Dr. Orr is a past president of the Canadian Society for Circumpolar Health, the International Union for Circumpolar Health, the North American Region of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, and a past consultant for the World Health Organization. Up to you now. Well, thanks very much. It's um, I'm wondering which presentation is mine. The second one. The second one? Oh, okay. All right. It's a real honor to be uh, asked to talk today. There we are. Um, here we go. Uh, the the meaning of um, of my title will become clear, I hope, as uh, as the talk goes along. I'm really trying to say that uh, getting involved in trying to mitigate or decrease the determinants of these two infections is uh, is all our business, um, and that uh, the determinants are in our own front yard. They're not hiding somewhere, they're not hard to see, they're right out there. Um, so I want to uh, reemphasize the land acknowledgement uh, that we've talked about to, to, to emphasize our um, obligations in terms of the peoples and the land that, um, on which we, we stand and work. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. I speak from my own perspective today, uh, and my objectives are not to give uh, a lecture about the determinants or, or to enumerate them. It's rather to uh, try to inspire all of us, including myself, uh, to, to take care of this business that we have, uh, to get involved and to understand that um, uh, I'm speaking specifically to scientists for most of this talk, um, that uh, we can be scientists and get involved in the social determinants, uh, and, and in fact, we must get involved. Um, so it's a, uh, I'm going to take a couple of examples of the social determinants. I can't look at them all, but in specifically, we'll start with housing, um, nutrition, which is something that I've been very slow through my career to appreciate the importance of, uh, but better late than never. Um, knowledge uh, and empowerment, community support, culture, health systems. Um, I'm very grateful, as it'll become apparent, I think, <clears throat> to Linda Larkham for teaching me uh, a great deal about this, and, uh, and to John Schellenberg, who's in the audience. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about how he's uh, inspired um, myself as well as others. Um, we can think about the, uh, the, the woman uh, who acquires uh, TB and maybe HIV that Pierre talked about, an indigenous woman. Uh, I'm, so we're gonna talk about the determinants that affect both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples, foreign-born and, and Canadian-born. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm going to look at the determinants in general, but to say that the determinants that specifically affect the indigenous peoples, um, I may not be the best person to talk about that, but uh, I recognize the, and we all do here, the, the very specific and incredibly important um, aspects, particularly racism, racism that's involved. So, um, I'm going to talk about, uh, to begin with, three <coughs> case studies that are real, but I've sort of changed them so they're a little bit, so they're not recognizable uh, as an introduction. And so um, quite a few years ago, 
uh, some colleagues and I interviewed women with HIV, and um, the first uh, w one gave some experiences that uh, make us question how much of sexual behavior or, or addiction behavior is a personal choice, a behavioral choice versus um, uh, basically a survival mechanism. So this woman said the following, at that age, so small, I tried to commit suicide because I knew it wasn't right what he was doing. I started running away after I got older. When I started running away, I started sniffing gasoline because that was the only thing I could do because I was small. There was a garbage dump. People were throwing food away and we used to eat from there because they, our parents, were always drinking and not buying food. That was the only thing that we had to do because all the little kids were together protecting each other. It was always in the bush where we hung around together like that because nobody touched us. Another woman in this study uh, said the following. I, I would just point out that it says a lot uh, when um, you're safe and you can eat in a garbage dump and when it's safer to run away to the city and live on the streets than to live in your own community. So this woman said, I was broke all the time. I never had any money for food or cigarettes or anything. And it came to a point where I would hitchhike to get drugs and somebody would say, I'll give you so much money if you do this for me. And I did it. I walked away crying the first time. So um, those of us who are in care, uh, for instance, physicians, know that eventually the diagnosis of HIV and, and TB <coughs> comes late. Maybe the person becomes pregnant and is tested. They have another illness, uh, an assault, and they come into, into the emergency department and are tested. The incarceration, there's some outreach uh, that occurs, <coughs> and it leads to an HIV diagnosis. And unfortunately, the TB diagnosis, either as latent TB infection or as um, active disease, is often late also. Um, so the second story is also true. It's about how grief can kill you. Um, Carmen Lopez is in the audience. She knows this case. There was an individual who's the only survivor of a house fire in rural in a rural Man Manitoba community. And this individual, the, uh, his family died in the house fire, it was so stricken with grief and he was homeless that he left his community, went to the city and uh, was sleeping on a friend's couch. And he started to cough and lose weight, became very depressed. And he knew there was something wrong with him. He didn't know what it was. And he didn't want to put his friend in danger where he was sleeping. I mean, he didn't have a concept of tuberculosis, but he knew something's wrong and I, I don't want to hurt my friend. So he actually started living in a bus shelter where he was eventually found and diagnosed with tuberculosis and, uh, and also HIV. And the last case comes from uh, a researcher in Toronto, uh, Roger Antabe, and uh, he, interviewed an individual um, uh, who was black and uh, talking about sexuality. And uh, this individual said, uh, that is the biggest thing a lot of times people don't understand, that your sexuality and your masculinity are two different things. We label these things like he was talking about, sleeping with a lot of women as masculine, and that plays into your masculinity. Sleeping with a lot of women should not make you more of a man, right? but it does, and that's how society plays out. So, um, you know, there are lots of maps of, um, or graphics of the determinants of health, both the social and the biologic, and this is just one of them, um, and they're all flawed. Uh, this one is somewhat flawed because I don't, if you put racism, it, you have to put it under maybe culture or social environment, it's not particularly uh, prominent, although it is, in our world, it's very prominent. But anyway, this is at least one of the graphics about the determinants. And if we take those three cases, we basically covered, you know, almost all of these um, 
uh, issues, the, the, the culture of masculinity or, or sexuality, um, the, the healthy or very unhealthy child development and, and poverty, the social environment, um, uh, lack of social supports, the physical environment in terms of, um, of the, you know, garbage dumps and uh, of um, uh, lack of, um, y you know, in the housing, uh, we're going to see um, how housing contributes to, to illness. Uh, lack of educational literacy. Basically, they're all they're all involved. If you're involved in infectious diseases, we often use this triangle. I don't know how many people have seen the epidemiologic triangle of agent, you know, the bacteria, or virus, the host, and the environment. Um, and I like this, and I've used it for many years. But um, it is also extremely flawed. I often find have trouble putting some um, of the determinants between the host and the environment. For instance, some um, uh, behavior, let's say sexual behavior, there might be some element of, of, uh, of uh, personal choice in terms of the host, but then there's a very large element of the environment, like the social and the physical environment, as we've seen. So uh, many of these determinants sort of fit in between, and of course, it takes all of these um, points of interaction to to uh, to really create um, uh, illness, whether it's infectious disease or otherwise. So I'm going to start with one determinant, and that's housing. And uh, in in uh, the early 2000s, uh, Dr. Larkham and I went up to Lac Roche, which is a Dene community in northern Manitoba, uh, because there was an outbreak of. Uh, epidemic TB on top of endemic TB. And the incidence was up to 600 per 100,000, which you know from Dr. Plurd's note um, is extremely high. And uh, Dr. Larkin was involved in a project, uh, and I was lucky enough to, to get involved uh, with Dr. Nickerson also, looking at the uh, immunity, the immune response to tuberculosis, Th1 versus Th2 response, which is pretty fascinating. And I was involved in, also in terms of trying to manage the uh, outbreak. So Dr. Larkham put together a, um, in addition to doing the research and we did the clinical work, uh, a, a little movie about housing. And um, we can ask her, you know, why did you do this? Other than she's a brilliant communicator and I think she thought that uh, it would be a very good teaching tool. Um, uh, so uh, with that, I'm gonna ask our IT person to just put up the movie. It's about 10 minutes. And uh, I'll ask him to jack up the, the sound. My name is Lizard Denichizi. We could have maximum sound. I live in Nakboche, Manitoba. There's two, there's two houses that are still standing till today that were made in 1975 by elders. There were no young people there. They were built by elders. And these elders that built these, these um, buildings, they're still standing. 
and half of these um, elders are gone. They don't live with, they're, they're gone from this world. So. Call our what it would be, there was no skittles, there was only dog teams. So to get our dog, to get our wood, we have to um, put our dog team on a harness and get some wood. And also, if we're going to get our fresh water, it would be from down the lake, meaning that you have to get water from down that lake. In the wintertime, you better make a water hole and get some fresh water from there. What was inside was a wood stove, one bed, one little table, one little cupboard that only only my plates can fit in there, and my groceries would be on a on a leather uh, counter in a little small cupboard that had my dry goods in there, and I had a small little table, one uh, one bed in there. That's about it. kids and his granddaughter and also um, my brother-in-law and his wife they used to stay in there and my other in-laws that used to stay there were um, they had one daughter no two kids plus both of them so that's um, 10 11 12 people in one In a, in a tent. You never get sick. Never. I don't think I never see nobody get sick that time. The baby is born in a tent. My sister-in-law, her baby born in outside on Christmas. It is cold. When they start to have houses like here, people are getting sick. You know, T TB, cancer, like that. For a long time, people deliver like this. I never see sickness like that. Never. The woman who has a baby, 
He stayed in the tent for four days and already he could have chopped the wood on site like that. See? These people are tough. staying with a whole group of people like that, you know, it's uh, it's so crowded that you can't stay long with people, it's so crowded like that. Because so I've been living in this house for about, so about 24 years. Mm -hmm. Well, it was renovated once, but it was, all they did was just put the uh, room doors. My childhood, I never had, I never stayed in a new house, never had running water, never had electricity, and in 1987, when I first, when I, when my third child was three years old, that was my first, first new house I moved to, and I was so happy that I, that I moved into a new house like that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> but first of all, I want to say that when um, Linda and I went went up north to work on TB and talk to people about TB, an elder told Linda, uh, well, we, we spent quite a bit of time, um, you could use the word educating, but I don't like that word. Let, let's basically knowledge translation with the people through radio programs, going into the schools, talking in community centers about what is TB, it's a little bacteria, and how it's spread through the air. Um, and uh, at, at one point an elder said to uh, Linda, well, I know why we have TB. And uh, he said, well, it's because of the dams in the north, the hydroelectric dams. And when Lin Linda told me this and I thought, gee, we spent all this time explaining how, what is TB and how it's spread. Uh, you know, we kind of failed in our mission. But upon reflection, I realized that he was absolutely correct. And um, there have been a series of dams created uh, along the, the Nelson and Churchill rivers since the 1960s. And it's, display, it's, it's flooded 
enormous amounts of, of territory, trapping and hunting territory, graveyards, and uh, the people have been displaced, uh, often through, um, I'll just say, nefarious means. Uh, and so a whole way of life has been um, uh, destroyed and uh, with the subsequent uh, disintegration of, of societies. And this has been um, uh, very well described in a book called In Our Backyard by M.A. Kraft, a, a lawyer from here. Um, I encourage people to, to get it and to read it, but that's partly uh, in our backyard, uh, the, the dams, but really in our front yard, the determinants, the, the despoilation of a way of life. Uh, in fact, uh, Easterville or Chamawawin, uh people, when I went there, they described how they saw the bones of their ancestors from the cemeteries floating in the water that was flooded. Um, okay, so um, uh, th this, this movie w was made, and uh, sometime afterwards, um, uh, the... Manitoba Chief's uh, Health Pre Protectorate, uh, Health uh, Secretariat, asked uh, Linda and I to present it to a meeting uh, of the um, Manitoba Hydro. And we, we, at least I, I don't think Linda did either, I had no idea why we were asked to present at a Hydro meeting. But we went down there and we showed the meeting and they, they said thank you and we left. And later, uh, it was explained to us that uh, Hydro wanted to raise the rates um, for electricity in Lac Broche and a couple of other communities. And uh, after we showed this film and we left, um, the decision was made not to raise the rates. Uh, because uh, they saw the, I mean, incredible social conditions, uh, I think, were shocking to, to the people on the, on the Hydro board. Um, so this is an example. It was a it was an extraordinary example to me about how doing science, basically, Linda looking at immune function and and myself um, looking at um, um, at uh, the clinical control uh, had been asked by the chiefs um, to also look into housing while we were there, and uh, we had looked at each other and th thought, uh, well. We don't know much about housing, but that's what he's asked us to look at. And we do know there are papers relating uh, crowding and housing to risk of tuberculosis. So we did a housing survey and uh, we created the movie. And, and um, if someone had said to us, well, that's going to lead to an actual uh, really important um, effect on the determinants of health in this community, um, through electricity rates, uh, I, I wouldn't have believed them. Um, the other uh, effect was uh, it led to a CIHR grant to, for Linda and colleagues uh, to work with uh, Lancelot Corps and architecture students. And they took the architecture students up to Lac Broche to talk to the elders. And they took uh, high school students from Lac Broche down here and they designed a series of houses that were ecologically and culturally appropriate for the community. Now, these haven't been um, built yet, but they will be someday. So let's just take another determinant, and, and I arbitrarily picked nutrition, because uh, at least I'm one person who's overlooked nutrition for much of my life. So you, you're probably not surprised if I say that food insecurity is extremely common. Uh, all across Canada, 16% uh, in Canada, Manitoba, 18%, and in the north, 75%. Now, there are different ways to describe food insecurity, but we're talking about people who actually don't have enough food in the house. Um, uh, so what could we do? We're scientists. So why am I talking to you about nutrition? Um, well, there's this thing called hidden hunger, which has many meanings, but one of the meanings is that you look at people, let's say you look at people um, in some northern communities or southern rural communities or people on the street and you think uh, they, they don't look, uh, uh, you know, like they're hungry. In fact, they, some of them look what one might say overweight and over-nutritionalized. But when we talk about hidden hunger, it can mean 
uh, a lack of the, of the nutrients, uh, both vitamins and, and, and critical minerals, selenium, zinc, um, folic acid, uh, that are required for, uh, for immunity and for, for health. Um, when you look at uh, the prevalence of inadequate nutrient intake in Canada, it's really phenomenal. Let's take, um, uh, you know, zinc. Um, can be anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of Canadians don't take enough zinc in their in their diet. Um, so, of all these um, critical vitamins and and, um, and minerals, uh, I can take just three examples. Um, but you can see how they affect epithelial barriers, cellular immunity, antibody production. But let's just talk about vitamin D. Uh, vitamin A and zinc, arbitrarily. So vitamin D, uh, you know, when you read articles about vitamin D and uh, TB, it's they're they're very um, uh, they lull you into an idea. You know, studies from countries, and they say, um, uh, you, you know, we gave vitamin D to people with TB versus controls on the um, and the you know, the treated group did much better. Or we studied, you know, people with TB have lower vitamin D levels than people without TB. I mean, they make it seem very simplistic. Linda's work and, and that of others uh, show that there's um, a lot more than just a level of vitamin D. For instance, um, some, some groups like the Greenland Inuit have increased hydroxylation uh, of, of vitamin D vitamin D is taken into the skin and then has to be hydroxylated in the liver and and different people hydroxylate at different levels. Um, there's a vitamin D binding protein that nobody seems to pay any attention to, but it's very important. And uh, the DNA people that we, we showed have very high binding capacity. The, there's a difference in, in receptor genotype that's been shown by Elizabeth Sellers, who's, who works here in uh, pediatrics. So I'm just saying that um, we as scientists could uh, look much more closely into the issue of vitamin D and, and its re relation to tuberculosis. It may be a very important factor in, in uh, why some people move from uh, tuberculosis infection to disease. Might be the holy grail that, uh, that many of us are working on. Um, uh, vitamin A has uh, incredible um, uh, effects at various levels of the immune function. Um, I've listed them, some of them here. In HIV, there's decreased absorption of vitamin A and an increased requirement. And studies have shown that uh, HIV-infected children given vitamin A have decreased morbidity, but, but they haven't found the same thing in, in adults, and we don't really know why. In tuberculosis, um, TB-infected rats uh, who are given vitamin A showed decreased number of granuloma. This is the kind of work that Minu Sharma has been involved in, uh, not specifically maybe with vitamin A, but looking at an animal mod model. Um, and in case control studies in, in Haiti, um, TB patients, uh, TB is, is much more common in, in vitamin A deficient patients. Mind you, there are all sorts of confounders. So once again, um, maybe someone in the audience, um, maybe Titus, wants to look at uh, vitamin A and the response to the influenza vaccine. Maybe people working in Sandy Kiazik's lab want to look at vitamin A and, and, uh, and, and, and immunity to, to tuberculosis. Um, and finally, zinc, which um, I never knew much about. Uh, but zinc can be involved in... Um, uh, in the processes of uh, HSV, VZV, uh, HIV, um, influenza, uh, CMV, papillomavirus, at all these stages, um, the virus inactivation here, viral encoding, the viral genome transcription, viral protein translation. So at all these levels, uh, zinc affects the various um, uh, viral function. And um, it's known in terms of TB that zinc deficiency is associated with an impaired immune response to TB. So you can say, well, if I did work on um, uh, nutrients and HIV or TB, 
or influenza for that matter, how, how would that affect the determinants? Well, why wouldn't you uh, join forces with street advocates talking about, uh, about food security um, at, a, at a demonstration down at our legislature? Uh, or, um, or, or lobby for uh, increased funding at, at, um, at Manitoba Harvest. Um, uh, so that what I've shown in terms of, um, of uh, scientists, um, you know, linking hands with, with advocates uh, could be a model when we work in, in other areas of determinants uh, of health. And, and that moves us to knowledge and self-efficacy. And I have a picture here of Margaret Ormond, who, who passed away recently. And some time ago, she, with others, uh, at Kalashiva, which um, is no more, but eventually she was able to found um, Sunshine House, which is, uh, you know, uh, 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 basically a, a health advocacy organization just down the road. And she put together their booklet called Taking Care of Business. And uh, it was really, again, an eye-opener for me because I didn't think that people who had extreme survival problems in life, who were living, let's say, on the streets or involved in addiction, had that much interest in learning the intricacies of science. But that's not true. Uh, and Margaret would say, well, have you talked to the people? Have you asked them what they want? And uh, when you do talk to people, for instance, at Sunshine House, they want to know about the HIV virus, like how does it work, and tuberculosis, and, and uh, the science. So for instance, in um, this booklet called Taking Care of Business, there's actually you know, a diagram of the virus and how it, how it um, you know, takes over the machinery of the, of the cell. Uh, and she didn't put that in there because some, you know, she thought, oh, let's put in some science. It's because people actually want to know. So we, we have a visionary leader of medical microbiology, Keith Folk, who supports this kind of work, uh, and, and, and John Schellenberg, uh, down, just down the street. Um, uh, you know, medical microbiology is not in a bubble in a lab. It extends all the way down the streets and up into the rural areas of Manitoba. Uh, so knowledge and self-efficacy is a determinant of health. The more you increase it, the more people actually have some degree of power over their, over their life. Which leads us to another determinant, um, community support, advocacy, and action. And I'm really grateful to John Schellenberg for, for uh, educating me about what's going on in Manitoba in terms of community support. Um, so there's, a community, there's an organization called Gaganiganachek. Um, and they have um, a building on McDermott, which you may have uh, seen if you've passed by, bicycled by, or driven by. Uh, it's close to here. And they now ha rent a space in the Social Enterprise Building, which is on Main Street. And uh, in this building, they actually have a clinic where they do uh, STBBI testing. And th uh, this is uh, supported by a three-year grant that... Uh, from the WRHA, right, Pierre? The, the grant? Or from, from Manitoba Health and the Public Health Agency of Canada. So John Kim has been involved and in Pierre. Uh, and they have a nurse who's borrowed from um, the WRHA and, and doctors and, and, and what I'll call street or community workers. And... Um, men or women can drop by and have an STBBI uh, examination. Uh, they can have a test. Uh, they, all these other um, um, services are offered through, through the community setting. Um, and they, they have a sexual wellness lodge. Every Thursday morning of the first Thursday morning of the month, they have a pipe ceremony, which John took me to. Um, and they have a program called Ask Auntie. So you can ask Auntie any question, for instance, uh, se uh, about sexuality. Um, you know, uh, I went down with John uh, on uh, a Thursday in April, and I was wondering, am I some kind of tourist? Like, uh, is, that a, is that an appropriate thing to do, to go and, and, and to 
participate in the pipe ceremony, but not perhaps be able to give anything. But then, um, so you might ask that too. Anybody in the audience might come up to John and say, um, uh, can, I, can I go to the pipe ceremony? And, and we can see what John says. But basically, when, when people meet and, uh, and develop relationships, uh, you know, good things happen. And, and good things basically can't happen uh, without the development of relationships. So it starts here. Um, so uh, just going back to the um, taking care of business, which feeds into uh, the title of my talk, um, John is involved in trying to um, uh, basically redo that booklet that Margaret started, taking care of business. And uh, Yoav has been very supportive of that. We're looking for funds, I believe. Um, anyone in this room could say to John, I'm interested in knowledge dissemination. Um, uh, how can I get involved? And we could see what he was, who would say. Um, maybe like in the Jewish tradition, you have to ask three times before you, uh, to show that you're, you're really um, um, committed. Uh, uh, I was thinking about this Ask Auntie, and in the United States, uh, an indigenous man said that there's a, um, there's a telephone um, number across the United States for indigenous youth, and it's, it's called Ask Auntie. Um, I don't know, maybe it spells out Ask Auntie on the phone. And you can phone uh, day or night, and there's uh, an indigenous... Um, I don't know if it could be an uncle, but mostly an auntie, who will answer your question. So you can imagine all the youth across uh, the United States or Canada who are afraid to ask anyone about, uh, let's say, LGBT, uh, um, Q2 spirit plus uh, question, or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically a, a question um, uh, that... Um, that they believe is uh, might have some shame attached to it in the in the culture. Um, so, I'm not aware that, for instance, in Manitoba, that we have a a, a telephone line like that. But w why not? Or some kind of um, social media uh, line. Maybe um, others in the room know more about that. Uh, as John has uh, uh, let me know, there are all sorts of other organizations that are involved in community support from the Manitoba Harm Reduction Network. If you go online, they have a Peer Voices video, they have trainings, workshops, zines. Um, they had a testing drug pilot project, just like um, um, uh, Levi Foy from uh, Sunshine House also has, such, has a uh, drug testing project. Um, the mobile van, which I, I think many of you might have heard about, that Sunshine House has acquired. This is Sunshine House, just at the corner of Logan, and um, and Sherbrooke. Um, you know, it's uh, we have yet to have safer consumption spaces, although at least some many people in the room have advocated for that. Um, another determinant which any of us can can work on and be involved in has to do with identity and culture. Um, there's some pictures here uh, that have to do with indigenous identity, but it could be identity of, of, um, of individuals, especially youth from, uh, from who were born in other countries. Um, and, and there's plenty of literature that shows that uh, uh, individuals with a strong uh, feeling of identity and culture and support for that are uh, able to, um, uh, to be resilient in terms of... Um, of, uh, you know, um, behavior, uh, addictions, um, uh, sexual risk behaviors, uh, you know, the ill effects of uh, discrimination uh, and stigmatization. Um, and so, uh, just as an example, Dr. Larkham has received a CIHR grant to work with youth in the Churchill area to um, uh, look at cultural sites and um, and with with youth and and to map the uh, ancient uh, 
hunting and burial sites in the region. And this it will, will be looked at in terms of their, their health, their identity, um, uh, strength of culture, uh, resilience. Um, uh, if you say, well, you know, I, that's all very well, I can't go up to Churchill. Um, well, there are lots of projects here in the city to, um, you know, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, other projects um, um, that you can get involved in that, uh, that can build identity and culture. As another example, uh, Alain Baudry, who's um, uh, I met as a medical student and is working on his... Um, public health degree, uh, told me that in his life before medical school, he was an economist. And he worked with uh, an economist at University of Winnipeg, uh, Melanie O'Gorman, um, to uh, um, basically identify the hunting and trapping um, and land use uh, of um, indigenous peoples in the north in certain areas. And they wrote a report and that report was used by First Nations to actually get some degree of settlement from the, from the flooding agreement. So again, there's an example of um, looking at this determinant of identity and culture, um, doing science essentially, it was uh, economic science in his case. Um, uh, in Linda's case, it's uh, social and physical health science. Uh, and then, uh, you know, joining forces with advocacy groups to actually make a real difference in terms of determinants. So I'm going to end um, just by talking about another incredibly important determinant uh, of health that um, at least some of us in the room are very involved in, others are, are not, and that's the actual health system, like the looking after patients, but also public health. and. Uh, and, and health administration. And so, uh, in my view, right now we have critical problems, inadequacies, I could use other words, in uh, our health system in all these areas. The type of, uh, the number of people we have, the type of personnel we have looking after patients and doing prevention, the, the places we work in, the mix, how we utilize health workers, the silos involved, the, the resources, what, the tyranny of the acute so that we never get to prevention um, because there's always something acute that needs another outbreak uh, on top of uh, you know, endemic ill health. The biases and racism and myths, the, the system that serves itself rather than the people, and a, an incredible lack of transparency and accountability. Uh, all in our province I'm speaking about, uh, of course, elsewhere also. We, we know what works. Um, uh, you know, community health workers, street workers, bringing health care to the people who need it. Um, you know, we talk about this social enterprise building with the clinic, but we should really be doing treatment and, 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 and counseling in, in mobile vans that, that go around the city. And it's needed in Thompson uh, and, uh, and, and the Paw and Flin Flon and all sorts of other communities. Carmen asked me, what happened? We, we used to have mobile diabetes vans in Thompson in the, in the 70s uh, and 80s. And, it, and, and that whole approach of community engagement uh, seems to be going backwards, not forwards. So um, John Lewis, who was, um, he was a, a, a member of Congress in the United States, uh, used to say, let's get out there and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Let's go out and create some, some good trouble, meaning um, advocate for a, a, you know, a decent healthcare system. Uh, and it, it really bothers me when people involved in the healthcare system uh, just kind of roll their eyes and say, oh, you know, it's the social determinants. Um, uh, of, of course, uh, I'm not referring to anyone specifically. And, and for instance, Pierre is here, and, and he's quite right when he says um, the social determinants are, are a large, uh, perhaps the largest reason why we have uh, HIV and TB um, epidemic uh, here 
as well as an epidemic in, in, in diabetes, renal failure, it's a, a cancer. Uh, but uh, if you're a healthcare worker, an administrator, um, a public health person, before you start to, you know, talk to, about the social determinants, take a good look in the mirror and ask yourself, well, I'm a health worker, what am I doing to make our health system better, our actual care? Um, and uh, I would close with the words of Stefan Grabowski. So he was, um, uh, he was a TB um, physician in the 60s and 70s, and he worked in uh, NWT in the area that, that's now called Nunavut. So he worked in the 60s and 70s with an absolutely dynamite program for TB, and he went up there with, with nurses and, and community health workers, and they did x-rays in the field, and, um, and they did skin tests, and they gave people uh, with um, uh, latent TB, uh, treatment for latent TB and for active TB, uh, active TB treatment, and, it, um, and the, the um, rate of TB, so Nunavut is this blue line, and uh, Nunavut wasn't born until 1999, but this is the Eastern Arctic, apparently, um, uh, the, the blue line. And so with Gravowski's incredibly um, uh, dynamic, um, you know, resource-intense, devoted uh, biologic program, medical program, the, the, he saw uh, the greatest ever recorded drop in TB incidence in the world. So it went from roughly, uh, oh, where's my mouse, over 1,000 per 100,000 in 1965 down to, um, here we go, well, down to, by, by 1980, to, uh, to around 100 per 100,000. And the, uh, during that time, the social determinants were, were not changed remarkably. The bad housing, the poor nutrition, the terrible education in uh, the Eastern Arctic was the same. Uh, I know because I went up there myself in, um, in 1979, 1980. Uh, so I'm just ending on the note that uh, of all the determinants, the social uh, ones are the most important, but, uh, but the excuse of turning to them because we in this room and as healthcare workers and scientists are not directly involved is, um, uh, is, is not a, a, a good pathway to follow. Uh, we really should um, first try to get engaged in um, outside our, our laboratory bubbles as our, as our leaders are showing us, and also to, um, to use whatever influence we have in the, in the biomedical field to, to uh, have a system that we can actually uh, you know, uh, support and be proud of. So thank you very much.